Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. We're joined by Dr. Jonathan Ng. Dr. Ng will be discussing the challenges and solutions of full mouth reconstructions. At any point during the webinar, if you have a question, please feel free to type it into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll get back to you via email within two business days. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this webinar live or on demand. Dr. Ng, take it away. Well, thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction. Uh, honor and privilege for me to be with you all. I know that uh, times are different where we used to be able to meet in person all the time whenever we wanted to, but now uh, we do everything through virtual means, oftentimes with webinars like this. So I'm hoping we can still connect in the future sometime. But uh, in today's time that we have together, I wanna share with you a little bit about what I do in my practice, especially when it comes to full mouth reconstructions, both for implants and natural teeth. So you can see how the technology is really changing the way that I do things and how it will change for you. As mentioned, I'm a prosthodontist here in the city of uh, beautiful British Columbia or Vancouver and beautiful British Columbia, Canada. And I wish that, uh, you know, one day I'll be able to come and uh, meet you where you're at. And if you're able to come up to Vancouver to see me. But gone are the days where we're able to easily meet like this. Uh, here's me at the Vancouver sort of uh, conference called the Pacific Dental Conference. This was just a few days before the pandemic sort of broke out. But here am I on the stage sharing information with others around me. And I love doing this because, again, that's where we really share our knowledge. And so one day again, we'll be able to do that again. And hopefully we can soon. But until then, I want you to be um, connected. And so stuff like social media is exactly where we connect with each other. Uh, for me, I'm a prosthodontist. So the easiest to remember, prosthodontist.ca is my website. So you go there to get information, uh, how to kind of connect with me. But also, if you are on Instagram, that is probably the fastest way to get in touch with me. But what I'm going to do is a little something that I always do on Instagram. And I wish I could do in person. And when we were in person, I used to do this. Selfie. So I'm going to do this right here, and, and we'll, I'll get you all involved. Hey, everyone. We're talking about full mouth reconstructions here online. And so I wish we would be able to do it in person. I want to show you this is a real background, not my uh, uh, not a Zoom background. But uh, good to see you all, and we'll be uh, in touch soon. Okay, so people ask, well, why did you do that? Why are we doing this kind of, uh, you know, video? Well, again, if you're on Instagram, you're going to see that basically instantly around the world. The entire world knows we're talking about digital dentistry. So I encourage you to utilize that technology for both just learning and also realizing that technology is moving fast. So as I mentioned, you know, I'm in the city of Vancouver. Uh, beautiful sunny day today. This is literally what it looks like um, uh, out my office window. People say, that's just a Google image. Well, if you look at my Instagram, you'll see that actually this is what I'm looking at out my office when I'm digital treatment planning and doing other things. When the sun sets or when the clouds roll in, it looks like this. And here you can see the sunset. So beautiful view here in Vancouver. So if you can come by, uh, give me a call and uh, we'll see if we're able to uh, uh, show you some of this. But for me, I love technology. I was the very first in Canada to have the Trios 3 when it came out. And then of course, when the Trios 4 was released, I was the very first person in all of Canada to have it. So uh, I was very proud to be able to open it, use it, um, kind of compare them. So if you want to go to my YouTube page, sorry, shameless plug there, but take a look and you'll see basically I compare them. Uh, if you're interested in buying a, a unit or you know, want to know some information about it, you can take a look at it. So there I am being the very first in Canada as well. As I mentioned, you know, back in the uh, pre-pandemic times, uh, we were able to do things like this. I was at the Three Shape Symposium in, uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. This is, uh, I'm in that picture. Why don't you take a quick look Zoom in, see if you can kind of uh, find me. Like, where's Waldo? Give you a second to take a look. All right, there we go. Give you a, a little bit of a help there. So there's not a whole lot of uh, physical distance happening there. But uh, like I said, one day soon, we'll be able to meet together and do this kind of stuff again. Uh, I, again, I love doing this uh, in person. But uh, for now, this would be a great way for us to at least learn and uh, share knowledge. So one day, we'll be able to do that again. Um, but before, until then, I want to show you a little bit about what digital dentistry looks like in my office. Just before we get into a whole meat of everything, I'm going to show you a short video of what it looks like in my office, and we'll reconnect.
All right, so as you can see, digital dentistry runs very deep in the way I practice dentistry. Every patient interaction uh, involves a lot of computers and screens and things that really show patients what we're talking about. So I'm hoping that I can show you a little bit in what we're going to do today. So in the uh, short period of time that we have, I think we have uh, maybe four or five hours. I'm, I'm just kidding. We just have a, a short period of time here, but I'm going to outline what we're going to talk about. Before we start, I want to be clear to make sure you know that patients, all the pictures you're going to see, patients are fully aware of the fact that I'm sharing information about their pictures. So they have uh, signed disclaimers for that as well, too. But I want to start with a little bit about, you know, why digital? I mean, we'll send a short period about what, what it is and, and why it's important for us in our practice. So how are we going to use it? Um, part of the planning that I like to use is uh, some 3D face scanning and how that incorporates into full 3D digital treatment planning. Uh, then we'll talk about why you're going to get better clinical success with a, what we call a digital first approach. I think that's very important because oftentimes, you know, there's different parts of the approach that we can use that is conventional digital, but I want to show you in my case, what I think is going to be giving you better clinical success. Um, digital workflow. How are we going to improve patient clinical case acceptance? Patients, how are they going to accept what we're talking about? What are they going to, how are they going to do what we're talking about if, uh, and that's acceptance. If they don't accept it, we're not going to be having any treatment to do. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, digital workflow, it's a lot of steps. So today what I want to do is show you a little bit of what, about what those steps are. So we can show you basically how that works from sort of point A to point B. And of course, what are these advancements and how are you going to use them in your practice? So I love starting with quotes of this nature because it's my favorite quote of all time. Basically it says, whosoever desires constant success must change his conduct with the times. I think this is very important because even in the 1400s, they knew that you know times are changing. And certainly times are changing for us in our everyday life. So let's look to telecommunications. I, I'm sure all of us have you know some sort of cell phone, but if you look at the very first cell phone that's ever existed, um, you know, commercially, it's something like this. If you still have that, it's probably worth a lot of money on the uh, sort of the hipster market. But, uh, you know, I remember it from those old Chinese movies where they got out of the, the van and like hit somebody with this, so self-defense. But it got, an, it accomplished something. It helped us get in touch with our families and so that they knew where we were. But that's about it. Nowadays, we all have, you know, smartphones. You know, here we got a iPhone 13 now. We're, uh, we're, we're, we're basically scanning with a LiDAR scanner. We're doing all the things that we couldn't even imagine in those times back then. In fact, Phones are now foldable. You have a touch screen that you can fold. I mean, that's amazing. This kind of technology, I couldn't even dream of that back then during that original phone. So times have changed. What about for us in dentistry? As a process honest, I do, you know, everything with treatment planning requires a lot of, um, you know, models. And in this case, wax ups. If you're a student, you're probably waxing this up for a whole week. If you're a lab technician, probably a couple hours. But either way, once you get that, it's basically a solid piece that you can't really change unless you send it back or do something else. What about digital? If we're able to show our patients um, what their teeth look like before, what the proposed teeth could look like, uh, we're going to be able to basically have our patients understand what it looks like. As you can see here, we have overlay of sort of this sort of purplish color with the ivory showing a proposal versus the actual teeth themselves. Really kind of you know puts rubber to meet the road when you see sort of what we need to do. So the question I often get is sort of, well, why do we got to do digital? You know, like I've been doing dentistry for, you know, my whole career. I mean, for me, I've been, you know, look like it, but I've been doing dentistry for over 15, 16 years. And I've seen it go from non-digital to now it is digital. So people ask, well, why? Why do we even need to go digital? I'm, I'm all right with the way I've been doing it. I think what we need to do is look at not why, but what it is. So before we go into that, we'll talk about, you know, the, the term workflow. We hear it all the time. Uh, people say, you know, this and that workflow. I think basically to define it, we're basically going from point A to point B. So for us in dentistry, there's so many different things that we can can do, whether it's, um, you know, cementation or whatever the case may be, but we have a chief complaint, a chief concern, and we have some sort of final outcome, all steps in between. Now, for those of us, you know, in our practice, if our patients are looking great, you know, the patients come in, the teeth look like this, uh, we're not talking about formal reconstruction. We're talking about maintenance, hygiene, um, that's about it, not a whole lot to do. But Patients come into my practice looking like this. And I'm sure in your office, if you look through all your patients, you're going to get a little bit of everything. But I think that what is true is basically for all of the, the, the types of patients, we always start with the same philosophy. One route where all the tree branches are essentially little offshoots of the main focus. So whether your patient is um, you know, missing a tooth, missing multiple teeth, uh, they're going to be missing all their teeth or they don't have any teeth at all. I firmly believe that at least when it comes to full multi reconstruction, um, the treatment planning philosophy is the same. So it's very important for us to know that, you know, even for me, I start, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of treatment. I, I, I place implants, I restore implants. Uh, so I kind of plan from start to finish. 
for those of you who are restoring or and or placing surgical implants or whatever the case may be, whatever we do, we always begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. I live in the city of Vancouver where everybody's tearing down houses and rebuilding them. And, um, you know, no city that I've heard of will allow you to break ground on, a, on a, if you don't have any plans. They'll say, well, what you, submit your plans and then we'll give you a permit for that. Uh, so the city's not going to let you do anything if you don't begin with the end in mind. So, uh, you know, certainly our patients will not either. So that's why we hear terms like, you know, prosthetically driven, um, whatever it may be. So implant placement, uh, uh, crown preparation, whatever the case may be. We're basically starting with some sort of plan. So we don't run into problems, you know, when it comes to implant surgery, stuff like this. You know, they didn't have a plan. They basically saw a bone and they put some implants. Um, you know, these are not my cases. These are Google images. Uh, you just Google wrong implants or something like that and you'll find that. And then we got, you know, angled implants that maybe weren't supposed to be angled. You know, maybe they're deciding some sort of all on four and changed their mind. And the worst of them all is this one here. I don't know if uh, any amazing lab is going to be able to do any type of gymnastics to get your prosthetic to look natural in that case. So uh, something went wrong. So I wasn't there. I don't know what the, the, the clinician was thinking, but uh, certainly we can hopefully plan around that to avoid it. So if we look at all our patients as a whole, it's very important for us to look at them this way. You know, sometimes they come in and they're, they're clutch, clutching their face. That's the very first thing that comes to your mind. The very first thing. People are thinking root canal, extraction. All those things are treatment options already. We've thought, we haven't thought about sort of why this patient is that this way. So it's very important for us to look at two main things before we get started on any of this full month reconstruction is diagnosis and treatment planning. So I do sessions on diagnosis and treatment planning. This is not that. We're gonna spend just a couple slides to show you sort of what's important, but I wanna define these two to really help you understand why it's important that we have proper diagnosis and treatment planning. According to the Web Research Dictionary, basically diagnosis is the determination of the nature of a disease. So what, what, what's this disease? Treatment planning is the sequence of procedures planned for the treatment of a patient after diagnosis, after diagnosis. You see it's underlined. We can't have a treatment plan unless we have a diagnosis. Extraction, root canal. Those are treatment plans before we've ever even figured out what happened. Patients grinding their teeth. Did they get in a car accident? Um, did they have endo? Did they have caries? Perio issues? These are all things we got diagnosed before. So very important because otherwise, you know, we, we can cut crowns. We can place implants. Those are, those are not, that's, you know, they're hard, but they're not the, that's the easy part when it comes to making sure we have long-term solutions for our patients. So therefore, I don't think it's just diagnosis and treatment planning, in fact, it's actually diagnosis, planning, and treatment. So that's important because we it's, it's so important that we need to know what caused the problem before we come up with solutions. Now, as we talk about digital technology, you know, people will say, oh, it crowns fit better, um, you know, it makes things, you know, nicer fitting because we can mill them. I mean, that's, that's amazing and all, but let's look to the literature. If we look at the American College of Prosthodontists, they put out a, a sort of summary. So if you can't sleep one night, you want to read this article, it's great. But basically, I want to summarize the Coles Notes, four main points. So basically, the number one key benefit of digital technology is improved communication. I mean, we already know it's improved quality. We're going to store our stuff easier and better. But the number one is improved communication. Now, why is that important? I mean, you and I, we can cut crowns, we can place implants. But it doesn't matter if patients don't understand what we're doing. They're not going to do it. We didn't communicate it with them. We're not doing that. We're not basically preparing grounds or doing anything. So it's very important for us to look at that way. And also important for us to look at things like digital impressions, um, you know, not just as taking an imprint, right? People have often said to me, you know, you talk about digital impressions all the time. Again, this is condensed. I do a whole seminars on this as well. But patients will say, I take PVS for my whole career and I'm the best PVS taker in the world. That may be true, but, you know, that doesn't mean you can control the uh, expansion and contraction of materials, the uh, the pouring time, the the temperature of the, the the driver's car in which they're driving it out. All these things are well documented to cause potential problems. So we look at digital impressions and what you'll see for the rest of the seminar is that it's not just taking an imprint, but it is a transformation in the way of patient treatment, a transformation. So hopefully we can, you know, see through the what we're looking at today, that what I've been doing is a transformation in the way the patients are understanding their treatment. But as I mentioned, the number one key benefit is better communication. Oftentimes, there's this very big communication divide, this sort of space between clinician and clinician and lab and dentist and dentist and patient. So it's very important for us to know what is uh, this divide. So let me show you a short video on that as well, and we'll reconnect. 
communication between clinicians and clinicians and patients, uh, clinicians and laboratories has significantly improved through the use of digital technology. Uh, what used to be a um, sort of separated systems, people had to talk to each other on the phone, imagining pictures where it was, is now literally at the fingertips on your phone. You can see a design, you can uh, show patients with excitement apps, you can show labs what I discussed with the patient on these apps. Um, we can now communicate so much so that the patient can pretty much literally see what their final look will look like before we've even prepared the teeth. And so I think that's extremely beneficial. And so patients have found, uh, young and old, have, have really drawn towards that. And so from a practice building perspective, it's been fantastic. I feel the patients are really um, excited as we buy into the, the, the total treatment philosophy. At the same time, I think that as a clinical standpoint, my communication with the lab has significantly improved. I think that it really connects the bridge, the gap that was there before, where a lab would do their thing, a clinician would do their thing, and there's no sort of connection between. Okay, so as you can see, the communication divide is this space, this chasm between two parties on both sides, whoever that may be, and we're hoping to bridge that with the digital technology. So as we talked about, uh, you know, prosthetically driven planning, uh, I think that's important. But um, what's more important, though, is that the fact that crowns and teeth, they fit within a face. We don't have a smile without a face. So that's why face in planning is extremely important. I see that, you know, oftentimes you may get a case back from the lab and it sits on an articulator. It looks great. Um, you put it in the patient's mouth and it's completely slanted. The, the, the facial plane is completely wrong. Something was mismatched. It looks great in relation to the other teeth but not in the patient's face. So face in planning, I think is critical. And this is where digital really steps up. So there's various ways to do this. Um, you know, there's there's different companies that do it as well. Uh, Zircon Zon has a very uh, sophisticated articulator system where you take basically a, uh, a face bow uh, uh, with a patient. Face Hunter is this basically a uh, camera that takes pictures and relates those two together. So it connects basically the dots between face and, um, and, and, and jaw. There's also a very simple uh, version called Bellis 3D. It's also uh, an iPad uh, or done on an iPad. So it's very easy for us to use. So I'm gonna quickly show you a little bit of that one because uh, I've been using that one a lot in my office. But what you need basically for that to work is an iPad um, or an iPhone, something that recognizes your face in 3D. Uh, and or if you're anti, you know, iOS, uh, you know, which I understand, uh, you can also get a camera that does that for you as well. But what it does basically is that we're taking two things. One is the some sort of image capture and of course a patient. And once you do that, you establish what's called, well, what looks like a, a 3D face. So, you know, young and old patients will love this. They're basically, you know, rolling the floor laughing about how their face looks when they when we roll it side by side. But what this gives us is amazing information about midline, occlusal plane, lip support, uh, allotragus line. These are things that we can't, um, you know, take in pictures. Uh, they're very hard to and transfer over because digitally we can take the actual digital impression and put that into use. So what does that look like? Of course, you can either use digital impressions or in my case when I'm placing implants is a, obviously CBCT, 3D scanning. We combine that with our uh, face scan. So on your left hand side, you see uh, the digital impression lined up to the patient's actual teeth. And then we can basically put it in the patient's face, move around and see where the teeth are. So now we have occlusal plane, we have midline, we have sort of uh, anterior posterior positions. On the right hand side, you see an actual CBCT scan in the patient's uh, face. So now for oral surgeons or others, we can start to plan out orthodontic surgery. We look at ortho changes. Um, all of these things can now be quantified before and after, see how much movement we've had. Amazing. So I think it's very important for us to know that face in planning is where I think it starts now. But for me, you know, CBCT scanning is very important, obviously, because as we just said here, but also uh, for me, I, you know, in my office, I do a lot of implants. So it's very important for us to understand what a CBCT scanner is. And so those of you who do have it, you understand that there's lots of uses for them, but what can we use a CBCT scanner for? So most commonly, you know, implant planning, uh, you know, looking at sinuses, uh, for those of you who are doing it, root canals, endos, it's very good to um, look for uh, 3D positioning of canals, uh, accessory canals and others. Uh, TMJ evaluation for those uh, of you looking at uh, uh, joint issues. For me, when I do surgery and crown lengthening, it's important for me to assess the thickness of the buccal bone. Um, it's easy for us to see in a mouth that crown lengthening is needed, but once we establish that um, the buccal bone is thin or there is no buccal bone, then it may not be wise or uh, the positioning of these roots buccal is very important as well. 
as I mentioned, orthodontic surgery as well is very important. And the, the, the uses are endless. There's, there's much more things. But what I think is important for us to look at is connecting the CBCT scanner. So as part of the entire treatment workflow philosophy is that, you know, we do a 3D face scan. Um, if we're doing implants, we do a CBCT scan. Um, there's many different scanners and different systems to use, but um, I use it you hear the Cavo OP3D uh, scanner, and it connects directly with this uh, DTX Studio. Um, it basically transfers you with a click of a button into this system so that I can start planning my implants. Now, you don't have to be using this system. If you have a CT scanner that is a different brand and you use a different implant software, uh, the, the main important part is that they're talking to each other. They're connected. Now, if you're, they're not the same brand or the same company, uh, it's very easy for us to export, um, you know, like sort of a flattened version, uh, you know, a, a DICOM file is what we call it. And those are essentially the language of a CT scan. And we can send that to be used in implant planning software. But the easy part and the most sort of continuous part of this workflow is the fact that we take our CT scan, we import it with a digital impression, as you see here, and we can start to plan our implant positions. So now we have all the patient's information from their skin and their face to their uh, uh, jaw position to the, the the gums and teeth and all that connected with a digital wax up. So that's important for us in, to, to know what is wh what is where and so that we can basically put them all together. Now, why is that important? Because this quote I, I love as well too, it says the objective of implant dentistry is to provide patients with an aesthetic and functional prosthesis. Aesthetic and functional. I mean, gone are the days where people say, you know what, it doesn't matter how it looks, it's just as long as it works. Um, or people say, you know what, it looks great, but it doesn't really work well, but I'm okay with it because it looks great. I firmly believe the two of them are, you know, there's a marriage of the two uh, uh, factors. If it looks good, it's got to work well. If it works well, it should look really good. And so for that reason, as I said, you know, full mouth reconstructions is where we want to talk about today. It's very important for us to uh, uh, understand some of these background things. Uh, as we talked about teeth who look, that look like this, there's not a lot of um, um, full mouth reconstruction happening. But what I want to focus on for the next short little bit is wear patterns. Now, this is important because oftentimes people who are needing full mouth reconstruction is because they're either missing teeth or they've worn away their teeth. And so patients who come to see you looking like this black and white image, they're not needing full mouth reconstruction. But patients who come to see you looking like this probably do. And so patients come to see me in various stages of their life. And uh, this patient you see here with broken teeth, I mean, that didn't happen because they got in a car accident last night. And if they did, you know, they wouldn't be coming to see you for a full mouth reconstruction right away. They'd be looking and wondering what, you know, what to do medically. But uh, basically, many patients show up like this and have taken a long time to get there. So it's important for us to really look at what wear patterns are so we can assess them and understand them as they come. So let's look quickly at what the different categories of wear patterns are. We've got mild wear, uh, where oftentimes patients are noticing some chipping, but it's no big deal. They kind of just like think that's natural in the way life is. Uh, then they get some moderate wear, where this may start to worry them because their teeth are looking shorter than they used to. Uh, and then we have excessive wear, which oftentimes patients are, you know, really complaining about these teeth that are half gone. At that point, we're looking at lost vertical dimension. It's a lot harder to deal with as well, too. So uh, it's important for us to sort of look at these as they come along. Hopefully you can um, uh, preserve the patient's teeth before it gets to that stage. So let's look at a few patients just to kind of break down some of these uh, scenarios. Uh, we got mild wear, which is Evan. He's 48 years old, comes to see me in my practice. He basically has uh, severely uh, thinned enamel. And he basically said in his words, he said, um, he looks like I got some incisal translucency. And I'm sure someone said that to him before, but we're not talking lithium to silicate, beautiful incisal translucency. We're talking about enamel that's about to flake off because it's so thin. Uh, that's not a good kind of translucency. So he, you know, is a CEO of a very um, big company here in Vancouver, and he's got lots of employees. He says he feels just very self-conscious about being with these uh, employees. So we'll talk about him afterwards as well. Before we do that, we're going to talk about uh, where Evan, who's 48, we're going to look at Jason, who's 58. You know, this is moderate wear. <clears throat> he's an airline pilot and basically grinds his teeth for eight hours as he's flying to Asia and other things. And he told me he's very embarrassed to talk to his uh, uh, crew because he says, you know, how can the captain of the of the ship be talking to the crew with broken teeth look like I just got in a fight? So that's uh, Jason, 58. Now, what about uh, excessive wear, right? We've got 58-year-old uh, Jason before. Now we've got William, who's 78 years old. So 78-year-old William comes to see me and says, Dr. Ng, I want some implants. I said, where do you want implants? He goes, uh, right in the bottom. I'm like, I can't see the bottom teeth. Can you open up a little bit? He says, yes. Wow, that's a lot of wear. It's like, William, did you get in a car accident last night and break off your teeth? No. He wore those down over a long period of time. He was, at some point, 58-year-old Jason and 48-year-old uh, Evan at some point. 
So it's important for us to see our patients uh, that way. And we're going to look ahead to sort of what the trajectory of their life will be if they're wearing their teeth. We see these three men in different ages. Evan is going to be 78-year-old William. Uh, you know, we just leave it the way it is. So let's break down just one of the cases, easy to look at, uh, just one at a time. But we'll take a look at Eve, uh, Evan, who's 48 years old. So as I mentioned before, he's a uh, CEO of a company here, good-looking guy. Basically says that uh, I have to smile uh, like this. And I said, okay, that's not bad. Like, you know, what's wrong with that? And he goes, because if I smile uh, any differently, it's like this. Now, he his words actually said, you know, I feel like a, like a hobo if I smile like that. So he's kind of concerned, a little conscious about it. And so we said, yeah, let's, let's, let's get to, let's get to work. So basically um, we've got not a lot of space. As you can see here, he's grinding right to the front. He's, he's basically posturing his teeth forward, uh, leading to a lot of wear. I said, you know, Evan, it looks like you're grinding your teeth. He says, no, I'm not, I don't grind my teeth at night. I sleep like a baby with my mouth open. I said, okay, well, something's grinding these teeth away. Either it's acidic or some sort of uh, a parafunctional habit. So he said, okay, Evan's not a believer in the fact that he's grinding teeth. So I said, let's scan your teeth. Let's take a look at sort of where things are. What this is, is patient monitoring. It's scanning patient from point A and sometime later in the future point B. Green is things that haven't changed. And in red, you're going to see anything that's sort of, you know, more than or, or changed more than it was before. So we have some occlusal pitting on the molars. Oftentimes we show patients this, they're like, well, no big deal. It's just my molars. What is a big deal is the anterior teeth. So if we look closely at these incisal edges, we say, okay, let's zoom in and take a look at what is actually changed. Nine months have elapsed since I saw him. We took a scan and nine months later, we see 0.21 millimeters. And we say, what's the big deal? 0.21 millimeters, like a hair, you take two of them, put on top of each other, that's 0.21 millimeters. I say, okay, well, nine months. What about 18 months? That's 0.4. What about 36 months? You do the math, he's going to be William at 78. That's powerful. Patients see that, they say, oh my goodness, like my teeth are worrying away. You cannot in any possible way take an alginate impression and an alginate impression from nine months and show 0.21 millimeters of wear on the incisal edge. It's just impossible. So it's, it's, this is powerful tools that digital is going to be able to give us. So we go ahead. We basically say, let's start planning some teeth uh, uh, treatment. We've got to move his teeth. So on the bottom left or on the left side, you see uh, some ortho. I had some pre-prosthetic ortho for him to create room. There's not a lot of space there. And this is just a time-lapse patient monitoring of, uh, of his ortho. Uh, as Evan was a non-believer in the fact that he's wearing his teeth, he also didn't believe that he was uh, having his teeth moved well. So I said, okay, well, let's let's show you where they were and where they are now. And many of your patients are the same. They may say, you know, it's so slow, the change movement, I, I don't think they've moved. And certainly they have. So very important for us to use this information to show our patients, but also for us to plan. So on the right-hand side, you see here, this is me planning with my lab about how much space I need for these crowns. Remember, his teeth were postured where he was basically biting tip to tip end to end almost. And so there's um, you know, no way to uh, provide um, an ability to prep crowns. Uh, we're gonna be needing root canals because we're gonna go into the invasive, invading into the pulp space. But as you can see here, uh, it's a little faint, but if you see the before and after, we've created more space so that we only need to make a finish line and we can have crowns uh, sitting on the already worn spots as our prepped teeth. So that's important. That's very important. I think that these are things that we can put together uh, for our patients. But how does it look when we put it together? Here's his 3D face scan. His 3D face scan, I take that, you know, I start to plan things. I also use smile design, which is, uh, uh, many times we've heard of that, you know, it's basically a 2D image of the patient. We can put a proposal of what the teeth look like. We show our patients, patients love it. Uh, this is a very powerful tool. This is where we're gonna show our patients what they could potentially look like, literally on their face. Oftentimes patients say, I don't know what it's gonna look like. Well, here I can show you what it's gonna look like. Once we decide on that, we go ahead and we show our lab. I send that smile design to the lab and they can then do a proper uh, uh, 3D wax up. So this is what we saw at the very beginning. But on top of that, you'll see that this now goes into a articulator. We basically put that together on his face. So as you can see, allotragus line, we have the uh, TMJ positions. You know, people say, well, it's kind of arbitrary, you know, the position of the jaw joint. Well, that also is the case when we do an articulator. But uh, in this case, we're actually putting it on his face. So the power of this is allowing us to now have the uh, occlusal plane the uh, actual lip support, the actual lip line. And so we know the smile line and where it's going to end up so we can provide with better accuracy uh, uh, solutions for our patients. So here he is, Evan. We're going to fast forward to sort of what we ended up doing. We basically uh, finished up uh, the planning, prepared the teeth, and I used a combination of uh, uh, Emacs or lithium bacillus crowns with anteriors uh, as uh, zirconia layered 
uh, grounds. So the reason why, because he's still grinding his heat quite a bit. Here you can see an overlay. Uh, as you can see, slowly moving in, we have the midline shifted a bit so that we can correct that with our uh, clear liners. The length has increased quite a bit. And here's the final crowns uh, after that as well. So very beautiful result. We basically have nice gum response uh, because of the sort of zirconia crowns, uh, you know, very comfortable and nice for the gums. Uh, but the layering that we had there to give us a little bit of uh, uh, that nice incisal translucency, not the thin flecked away uh, uh, enamel style. So here he is. Here's Evan before, a little worried about that smile of his. Now he's able to smile uh, with confidence. He even gave us a nice uh, thumbs up after that. So as you can see, it's very, very nice for our patients to see what they're going to get, what's going to happen before we do it. And also makes what I do as a clinician uh, more predictable. So when it comes to Crown & Bridge, how do we use this technology? Like, like I said, scanning, 3D face scans, how do we put that together? I just want to quickly show you how, um, you know, we've been talking about full mouth reconstructions. Like people say, yeah, this is great for full mouth reconstructions, but what about the sing single teeth? Well, I'm going to show you that it's basically the same tree in the middle with the different branches, remember? And so how it works for me in my practice is that, you know, we do single crowns, we do multiple teeth, we do full mouth reconstructions. And so the same uh, is true for how we, we then use a scan. So I want to show you side by side what it looks like if we do single crowns or multiple crowns. So as you can see here, uh, we have a pre-prep scan. Uh, you know, that's very important. We have all our patients scanned beforehand so that they, uh, you know, if they're sitting in the waiting room, they shouldn't be. You just scan your patient every time. Uh, all patients should have a scan and then you can have a chronological order of these scans and make uh, assessments for wear and other things, recession, um, even calculus buildup. Anyways, so my staff, they will pre-prepare or pre-scan uh, before we do anything, before we freeze. So we get a nice bite as well, because that's important because oftentimes uh, patients will sit up after a long procedure and not have a clue how to bite their teeth because, you know, they've been open for a while, right? So we take our bite when they're fresh or they're frozen and they can be sitting up, they can do anything there. Then when it comes to preparation scan, that's sort of the easy part. Well, sometimes for the single teeth, which I'll show you here. But as you can see on the single tooth situation, what ends up happening is it just cuts out that single spot. When it comes to the scan, we're not re-scanning the whole teeth. We're not taking an impression of the whole arch. We're basically scanning the single tooth. So a single tooth scan becomes very straightforward. Um, you know, everything else is scanned already. Our bite is captured. And then we basically scan whatever preparations are there. Uh, if there's any bleeding in those areas, we blow some air, clean them off, re-scan those spots. Very easy. So it's not like the PVS where you take it out and you're like, oh, there's an air bubble on there. And it's like, oh, we've got to redo the whole thing. Uh, so that's the single tooth. Now for the multiple tooth, it's actually the exact same thing. Pre-scan, pre-bite, everything like that. Then we just delete those spots. But the difference is now we're scanning those sites uh, uh, right away. We basically scan our preparations. As you can see here, we're, you know, as fast as I'm scanning the other teeth, it's basically scanning all this here. Now people will say, what if there's bleeding? What if there's, um, you know, Things you can, you know, let's say yes, bleeding. Well, basically we can scan it. It's, I would stay still scanning. Finish the scan and you're going to get all the areas that have blood. You delete those spots and you rescan those while blowing air to clean those areas off. So again, much different than when we're taking a PVS and you're just, you know, hoping and praying that five minutes later, you're not going to see a, uh, you know, an air bubble. And then what happens? You take another one and pray that the air bubble is not on the same spot. Right? And you just, uh, you, there's another air bubble somewhere else. It's okay. The lab will put it together and we'll somehow make it work. Uh, well, gone are those days because now we can make sure we guarantee we zoom in and can see what we're working on. So that's important um, to know because uh, some of the features that we can also use are things like HD shots where we take a, uh, you know, intro cameras type shot with my scanner, to basically take a look at how these teeth uh, look, the preparations, that image actually gets overlaid on the actual 3D scan. So now your lab can reference with an HD quality image as to where that uh, finish line is. So then they're marking your margins much better. Very, very useful tools. These are things that, uh, you know, you took an intraoral camera, you know, they're always kind of blurry and stuff. Like, I mean, no lab's going to be able to use that on your PBS impression. It's just not happening, right? So this is very, very helpful for us to do that. So let's talk, talk about a case because that's how we really bring these together. Um, Mark, he's 45 years old. He says, I have to smile with my mouth closed. I say, well, how come, Mark? Like, why do you have to smile with mouth closed? He says, well, I can smile with that or my lips kind of tight like this. Now, Mark, he is the funniest, nicest guy uh, and one of the patients that we've ever met, but he doesn't look like it. He even told me sometimes people think he's rough. People think he's kind of a mean guy, but uh, he th he's like, it's, maybe it's because of my shaved head. But uh, I think he, we, we talked about it and we realized it's because he can't smile. He basically keeps his mouth closed or tight like that. And he says when he does smile big, he's really embarrassed to see, you know, this kind of area here subconsciously. He didn't really know what it was, but he just didn't want to show that part off. So what we see here in retracted smile is that we see, um, you know, teeth with some erosion, erosion patterns, uh, wear as well too. 
Uh, again, we're not going to talk about wear patterns and how those happen. Uh, but what I want to do is show you that basically through all the digital planning, we're able to go through the same steps that you just saw with Evan. We did a 3D face scan. We planned out the teeth with him. We were elongating his teeth quite a bit. So we showed him that in the plan as well. And then we go ahead and prepare the teeth. So here's his teeth prepared, overlaid or underlaid with his uh, previous teeth. And then you see how the length has now increased dramatically with his new uh, teeth. Now, in some ways, it looks quite long. It looks very long in this situation, but we plan for that because we want to follow the lower lip line. We want to give him uh, sort of a, an idea of what these teeth could look like. Uh, and, and so basically we compare it on his face. So as you can see here, you know, with the smile design, we had him smile as high as he can to show those teeth. We tried different lengths, different widths, and we tried to basically give him various options. Um, as you can see, uh, the lower, or sorry, in, in purple, the color of the teeth before, and then of course the ivory after. Uh, the lower teeth, as you can see, they're also shortened. Uh, so we plan for some uh, uh, incisal reduction of the teeth uh, instead of veneers and other things for there. Uh, we did do crowns on the canines to give them some guidance pattern and protect the front teeth. But uh, that's sort of a, a just more occlusal protection and other things of that nature. So here on the right side, you see this is the scan of his arch. So we pre-prep scan as usual, and then we do our uh, crown preparation scan. In this case, what I've done is I'm scanning the quad one, the right, right side. And then we let everything sort of finish up, take the cords out in the second uh, upper left quadrant. And so then we scan that on its own. If you see there's some bleeding, as I mentioned, you finish scanning that spot, you delete the spot and you rescan that. Uh, the, the scanners are so amazing that, you know, it scans what's changing. And obviously if, you know, liquids are flowing over, it doesn't look, re record those and records the things that are not changing, like soft tissue or hard tissue uh, and preps. So now we're on the uh, upper left uh, prepped teeth. You know, the right side, it doesn't matter now if it's bleeding or not, because we've already scanned them. We just don't even look at them with the camera and, 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 and we've captured everything we need. So as you can see here, we have a, a full arch scan uh, within seconds. We're basically capturing what we need there. We can zoom in, make sure our margins are, are, are all, uh, our finish lines are all captured. And then we uh, basically mark them off. Now, as you can see, the way that the bite is, those anterior teeth are not biting at all. If you had a physical uh, PBS impression stone model, you'd have to make sure you mount that. It doesn't kind of rock or, or change. Because this is a pre-preparation scan that we did for him, uh, the, the, the digital models are already mounted. They, they cannot move. In fact, you'll see later in another case where we don't have any teeth that are touching. They're floating. And we have casts that can now be printed in that position, designed in that position. So we don't need to rely on these GC pattern resins and all these things that also have expansion uh, contraction issues or silicone bite records that are uh, completely wrong as well too. So as you can see with Mark, he basically goes from having uh, worn teeth to nice protected teeth. Uh, you know, we talk about acid reflux, all that stuff with him as well. He had that control with his medical doctor. We basically want to protect the teeth as well. Now, in his case, a very good tissue response yet again. As you can see, his smile, which looked like this before, he now looks uh, a lot nicer with longer teeth as well. So as he said uh, at the very beginning, I have to smile with my mouth closed. He basically says now, um, you know, I basically have the confidence to smile any way I want. And so he is, uh, you know, just as happy as he's always been. But he says now his wife even says he just looks happier. He just looks more energetic. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to uh, know that our patients uh, want that as well, too. So as you can see here, patients, if they are understanding what we are talking about, they're going to want to be part of what we're talking about. Now, what that means is if we educate our patients, if they're fully aware of what is happening, they're going to be engaged. Patients don't know what's happening because they're not dentists. And if they were dentists, they would know what we were talking about, but they're not. And so oftentimes they're not engaged. And if they're not engaged, they're not excited about getting teeth worked on. So it's important for us to know that if we educate our patients, they're going to be engaged. And if they're engaged, they're going to be excited. So as you can see, and you have seen already, we do things like uh, smile design. Uh, that's important to, to know that we are part of a team. The, the lab technician and the dentist work together. But it's important for us to know that as a sort of like an architect, like this guy here, uh, he's not going to, you know, cut the wood and make the framing he's designing it and then someone is putting it together and so but they collaborate together so basically things can work better together um i want to basically spend a few minutes just talking about a, a few things how you know with with surgery you know this is part of my practice as well too when it comes to full mouth reconstructions whether it's with, with crowns or with uh, implants it's important for us to know that uh, guided surgery is requiring us to have a lot of digital planning and it allows us to do things a lot faster with a lot more accuracy. But uh, in my office, I don't just do guided surgery. I do a navigated surgery as well, too. But navigated surgery requiring digital technology for us to make these things happen and work together. And what navigated surgery looks like, if you haven't seen it before, uh, basically is a computer in which it plans 
you know, where everything is and we're using computer guidance like GPS. So my, my, my handpiece is following a, a camera and the camera knows exactly where things are. So why is that important? I think it's because, you know, navigated surgery is allowing us to take this digital technology, that same workflow that we have and move it into uh, creating real life uh, surgery for our patients. So you can see here, I'm looking at the computer screen or the nice view. Uh, no, just kidding. I'm actually not looking at the patient because the patient's mouth has a tracker, as you can see here. That tracker then allows us to, uh, the camera to know exactly where the surgery position is so that when it comes to the actual surgery itself, the camera can see where the whole handpiece is. And this is just a real quick video to show you that, uh, you know, this type of planning must be done digitally. And once we do that, the planned positions are then carried out with CT guided uh, accuracy. So that's cone beam CT that I mentioned at the very beginning. That is important for me to be able to convert that information into uh, uh, digital planning. So then when I do that, that blue part in the middle is the implant location. And then the implant head of the handpiece is followed. And we basically know where the whole drill is going to go. That allows me to have extreme confidence and accuracy and knowing that it's going to be accurate. Because when we have these tight situations like a lateral incisor where the orthodontist left me almost no space, uh, I'm able to put a 2.9 millimeter implant uh, with predictable accuracy. So that's something that uh, I think that uh, digital technology is allowing us to do at a much more important uh, or better rate than we have ever done before. But that's what navigated surgery. But I wanted to then talk a little bit back to guided surgery and where guided surgery has really changed the way that I do things like all on four or some of these, you know, sort of big situations uh, in which accuracy is very important and also the prosthetics as well. Um, so I'll quickly go over this just to, you know, give you an overview. I, again, I do seminars on this completely, but I want to show you as a part of the full mouth reconstruction, how this works. So a patient basically comes to see me. She's got wobbly teeth on the very top. Within the same day, we're able to go from what you see on the top to what you see on the bottom. That is a provisional. That is not your final restoration. That's a milled nano ceramic provisional that was inserted day of surgery. This is what she looked like at 9 a.m. when she came to see me. And this is what she looked like after about three and a half hours of surgery and prosthetics, as you see on the other side here. That is amazing. That is basically a provisional. She's not completed her final, as you can see here, basically a provisional. So how does that work? How does all that planning make us and allow us to do what we need? Well, the good thing is basically we only need, well, I only need three things in this case. 3D face scan, which we've talked about, Bellus 3D, CT scan, or sorry, digital impression, and a CT scan. So the CT scan gives us bone information. The digital impression gives us teeth and gums uh, information. And then the 3D face scan gives us face information. So all of that together is then going to combine to give us all the information we need so we can put it all together, just like what you see here, an articulator. Oftentimes people get a little worried about an articulator, but, uh, you know, all these terms that were, you know, you know, don't worry, we're not going to explain all these. They're not important for us to see right now. But the important part is that it, you're able to use this technology and use a digital articulator. Now, patients or you know, clinicians will often say, well, how does a digital articulator allow you to uh, know what these uh, bites and the positions work? Well, the good thing is I'm going to show you that now we can use all this information and combine it with what we call patient-specific motion. This is a patient's movement of their teeth in lateral excursions programmed now into their actual bite. So then the computer can take their information and put it into their digital articulator. So now we have actual information of their jaw movement, the sort of the, the, the excursions and protrusions movements. So then we can more accurately provide those positions that we want. So back to that surgery patient, this is what it looks like. We take our digital impression, we take our 3D face scan, we take our movements of teeth, and we put that all together. Now this is very cool and all, but this is important for because with no teeth there, we need to provide her with those teeth in a provisional, just like, you know, a full mouth reconstruction. We're changing the bite. We're changing the position of where these teeth come to. So regardless of your philosophy on type of occlusion, uh, we, we need to provide them with a new occlusion. So we're, we're not, we're not using their old bite. We're sort of forming a new one. So as you can see here, we're, we've changed significantly. The amount is sort of like a digital denture that's being formed here in bluish, uh, uh, in purplish, you'll see that's her original teeth big change. We've not arbitrarily moved her midline. We've used her face scan to know where that's going to be, the lip support and all these things. So because of that, we got extreme accuracy. As you can see here, all of that is now overlaid into her face. So you can predictably know where this provisional is going to be in relation to her lip line, uh, her smile line, and the midline. So it's very, very helpful for us to know that. So very quickly, I'm just going to show you the surgery. Basically, what you see here is um, 
uh, on the top left is the you know stacked guide. We're going to remove the teeth, use the 3D positioning uh, of her scan to position the guide, base guide, take out the teeth, then implant surgery guide. As I go along here, the uh, multi-units are already planned because the position of those uh, have been pre-planned so that I know the rotation and therefore the holes in the denture are pre-cut uh, as opposed to those of you who may have done a all-on-four or some sort of all-on-five conversion. Um, the denture part takes hours just to cut holes and then you have a thinned out denture. It's not good. So as you can see here on the bottom right-hand side, everything fits very perfectly there. So because of that, we now have a before and an after that is extremely predictable. You see that midline is bang on. We planned that with a digital impression, a face scan, and a CT scan. That's it. I took all that on our very first consultation appointment. By the time she confirmed what she wants to do and looked at the, the plan we talked about, we basically had all the information. There was no try-ins. There was no ability to do anything in the middle of that. We basically went straight from there to her surgery and got uh, results, as you see here. Okay, so I quickly looked at that because I want to jump right back into natural teeth when it comes to full mouth reconstruction. So what does full mouth reconstruction entail? We've been talking so much about all the different parts of it. Here's just to kind of finalize and show you sort of what that kind of looks like digitally, how we put that together. Because in full mouth reconstruction cases, I'm changing things like vertical dimension. Uh, we've got aesthetic changes, major changes. Jaw relation problems. Sometimes they don't have a right jaw position. So we're doing construction, reconstruction. And what's very important, of course, is temporization. How do we make sure a patient is able to tolerate this increase in vertical dimension. So temporization, very important, um, oftentimes overlooked, and then patients end up with a lot of problems. If we don't plan it right, and we don't also test it right. So I'm going to show you a case here. This is Mike, the one that's been rotating, and you see here, he's 56 years old. As you can see in this model, there is no contact points. How are we having casts that are floating? As you can see, these two casts are floating because we mounted this in the proper bite, which we digitally planned before and we put it in position uh, so that I was able to scan it, the actual prep scan, where it's floating. So hopefully I can show you how that looks here, but Mike basically says to me, he says, I hate that I have a resting face frown. What is a resting face frown? He basically looks like this when he's, uh, this is his not smile, this is not his, this is just him normally. And he basically says, I'm not mad, this is just the way I <laughs> oftentimes look because he's lost vertical dimension. His chin is now closer to his nose than he was before, and so his, frown and comes down. So I say, hey, we're trying to turn that frown upside down. I'm just kidding. Bad dad joke. I'm sorry. But basically, um, we're looking at many things. He's got loss of vertical dimension, aesthetic changes. Uh, we're going to do some temporization and a bunch of other things for him. So what does it look like? He basically looks like this. His, his, his upper teeth, his lower teeth. Um, he had an implant that was already placed by his uh, surgeon. Uh, he had a friend who was a surgeon that placed it for him. So we didn't plan that, uh, you know, with uh, the 3D planning. But basically, here he is with his, uh, with his frown. So as we go along, we do all our digital de design. We always start with smile design every time. So this is even before we present the, you know, we use this to present to our patients. Smile design requires us to take images, you know, and retracted smile. As you see here, I have some, uh, I had a Lucia jig lifted his, his anterior teeth and took a bite record of the back so I can scan his, uh, his teeth in the bite position. Then we go ahead and we, we do our smile design and we take a look and we basically create a, a look of his teeth giving him a, a sort of a view of what that could look like. Mike basically sees that and he says, yeah, that makes sense. I like that. That's going to give me a little bit of look at what I, I, I want to be. And so here is a sort of a 2D image of that. And just like with Evan, we go ahead and we plan all this. We present it with our patient, increase his bite in this picture and basically give him a look at what it could look like. And then we send this information to our lab. So once Mike, in this case, has looked at things and he says, you know what, that looks good. I want to confirm and, and, and proceed with that. Then we go ahead and we have our lab do uh, our, our actual 3D wax ups and, and, and planning. So as you can see here, basically the lab takes my, um, you know, my, 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 my Bellis 3D scan. They put it together in that slightly open bite position in which I scanned his digital impression. So you can see it's sitting in his mouth with the open bite position already, right? Floating casts, right? Those are the area where he's going to be floating. Then we go ahead and we put our uh, uh, wax up uh, and we had you know, multiple communications where I said I want longer, shorter teeth, and therefore we can basically, you know, communicate with our lab. This is this is prime communication with our lab, talking to them about what I, and then you can show your patient this, communicate with them as well. You can pause at any moment and draw onto it and show your patients and the lab what you've communicated. So this is an extreme tool. This is literally that combined, you know, that bridge, closing the gap. And then this, in this case, you can see that plan with the original wax up, with the preparations as well. So therefore you can see the current design you see on the picture there, I just circled that it's a little longer. We went with a little bit longer. The original wax up was a little bit off from what I didn't like. And then we go ahead and we have better preparations. So as you can see closely, it basically is an increased bite. 
were longer than our original wax up. We actually decided to open a little bit more. Uh, we had them in provisionals, uh, long story short, for, for about uh, three months. He basically used that to plan to make sure he was comfortable. And then we were able to increase. So we have a current, a previous, and the actual uh, uh, teeth from original. So that's, again, something you can't just you know, show with, uh, with conventional impressions. Putting those all together on one scan. And there's my preparations you can see underneath there. So as I mentioned before, um, if we're doing a single tooth crown, we're kind of conforming to the, the bite that's around it. You're not really changing the bite. You're not increasing vertical dimension. You just make sure it fits. You're conforming. For Mike, something like this, this is forming a bite. We're creating and forming a new bite. So that's why it's very important for us to know that there's form versus conform. Both of them require the same steps in preparation. So digital impressions, planning, and others. But certain steps become more important. So this sort of 3D face scan, the digital impression, the opening of bite, all these other things, the, the lateral excursion of movements. This is where we can now form a bite and create something new for him. So as you can see here, he's going to be upper and lower preparations. So I basically am doing upper and lower separately uh, just so that we can, you know, law dial in our, our, our aesthetics for the anterior and upper. But this is what it looks like. He basically, I you have upper and lower. This is previous or pre-prep. As you can see here, we're going to fade in his preparations, all arch, full arch preparation, and fade in his uh, lower arch, full arch preparation as well too. We could do this in multiple ways where we prepare upper and lower at the same time. That's a very stressful day for me and for the patient. Uh, oftentimes in these cases, I like to separate it one arch at a time. And because of digital, we can do that. So we can basically lock in his, his bite position. Uh, the provisionals are basically uh, you know, made off of a wax up that is digitally made. And then here you have his uh, upper and lower preps. So as you can see here, upper and lower preparations, full arch preparation of all his teeth. Uh, I provisionalized his teeth with a single full arch um, chair side. Uh, just for the time in, in which we made a uh, lab fabricated afterwards. Uh, but just to kind of show you what that looks like. And then here are his uh, final upper crowns, just to see that he had full multiple reconstruction uh, very nicely. So as I mentioned, I do one arch at a time often. And in this case, I uh, dealt with his upper arch first. And here's what his upper arch looks like, seated in place, and now prepped his lower arch. So as you can see, floating cast, as I mentioned before. I call this the floating cast because now we have the lower teeth prepped in the proper bite position because we had him in provisionals. We scanned all that and basically uh, had the position of his teeth pre-positioned. So now the, the final crowns are going to come back here are going to be exactly the height that we want them to be. So then as you can see, we combine all that together with his digital uh, fi uh, findings from before. And then that's when it's important for us to know form versus conform. All right, so one of our last cases we want to talk about before we finish up today is uh, Wesley. He uh, uh, comes to see me. He basically says, my wife says my teeth look bad. Just what do you think? Let's take a look and uh, what do you think? Uh, I said, you know, Wesley, you know, I, I see some issues with the teeth and, uh, you know, I understand your wife has some concerns. So uh, let's take a look. Let's put you to planning. So we've talked about how all of the stuff that I've done before with digital 3D face scan to digital impression to wax up to all that, all that happened for Wesley as well. And so therefore we were able to provide him with plans. We talked about things like uh, uh, crown lengthening of the central incisors. You can see the height is different. We're able to show him that, um, you know, we're trying to increase the, the length of the teeth, all that. So I'm not going to show you all that right away. I'm going to show you jump right to the, the sort of the final product to show you that this digital technology allows us to show um, beforehand pre-planning with the patient. So now with our final crowns, you can see that central incisor is now taller than the uh, other central incisor. And that allows us to know and prepare him for that as well, too. So therefore, as you can see here, flows in there and we have our final restorations on the right and on the left hand side, you see his uh, pre-preparation state. So what a difference, significant difference. He looks completely different. In fact, this is what he looks like at the very beginning. This is Wesley when I first saw him, we're planning out his case. This is what he looks like after we insert those upper teeth. So the, the, the smile is dramatically different. We see that basically with the digital planning, um, we're able to go from that to nice final restoration. As you see, that picture is a um, on the time of insert. So the gums are a little bit red, uh, sorry, a little bit puffy, but uh, we'll take another picture, you know, when we see him again uh, in a few weeks to basically show you what that looks like. But uh, I wish I had a chance to show you that, you know, in person, but basically the technology, as you can see, really gives us an ability to bring our patients from what you see at the before and all the way to the after. As we start at the very beginning, there's a workflow from uh, start to finish, patient's chief concern, to final outcome. All the steps in between is kind of broken down for you as well. It's allowing us now to have a patient from what you see on the left to what you see on the right. Now patients themselves, they don't necessarily care so much about all the steps in between, but sometimes if we don't explain those to them, they don't understand why there's all those steps in between. 
So it's very important for us to educate our patients. So they're very much involved in what's happening. So I firmly believe that, you know, proper treatment planning provides us with better outcomes. We're not going to be able to give our patients uh, good outcomes if we aren't treatment planning. If we just jump to, you know, teeth are broken, they need crowns. Well, many of us can prepare crowns, but the fact is, how do we make sure that they fit well, they look good, and we're not hassling with the fact that everything is completely off? Well, that's important for us to communicate. And so the communication divide, I firmly believe technology has decreased that chasm. The bridge is now forming across that gap so that we can basically collaborate with other clinicians, with labs, and our patients. So that when we have patient-centered uh, care, then that collaboration is going to be better. I mean, unfortunately, with uh, coronavirus times, we're not going to be putting our hands on top of each other. But uh, theoretically, uh, we are doing this together. Basically, as a lab and a clinician are communicating, we must communicate with our patients. Also, patients will communicate with us what they want. But sometimes it's hard for them to say what that is. So we can show them. And they can show us. And then we can show the lab. So all those are very important for us to combine together because as the architect, you know, for you, for I, as a dentist and as a specialist and the prosthodontist, oftentimes I'm planning different things like an architect. And that way I can then collaborate with you and the and others and the patient most importantly. So they're basically part of it as well too. So with patient-centered uh, care, we're basically able to collaborate, uh, digital plan and have better patient satisfaction. So patients with digital treatment planning are going to be able to be provided with much better outcomes. That's just the bottom line. Many of our patients, including the patient you see here, you know, we didn't talk about his case, but all these different cases that I've been showing you, they basically, you know, if they're educated with what this is, is needed, they're going to be engaged with what's happening. If they're engaged, they're going to be excited. Many of the patients I ask them after the fact, I say, hey, if you were referred for a single tooth crown and we ended up doing a full month reconstruction, you know, patients often will, will, will be upset about the fact that we're talking about all these major work. But when we educate them about the loss of vertical dimension, the acid reflux, the uh, the fact that these teeth are chipped, the future potential of what's going to happen with their teeth. We're educating them with all the different steps of what things are going to happen. They're going to be engaged with their treatment. If they're engaged with what's happening, they're going to be very excited about what is to come. All of my patients, when I begin with the end in mind, they know all the steps that are happening so that as they go along, they're engaged with every step as well. So they're excited about every step that's to come. So with that being said, that way when we have things like 3D face scan, we have uh, 2D smile designs, all that kind of stuff, uh, it's very important for us to remember that digital impressions is not just taking an imprint. It's not just taking an imprint. I hope you've seen that as a transformation in the way I treat my patients and that you can treat your patients because, you know, gone are the days where we're just thinking, you know, the lab can just do whatever and, and it comes back and it's going to fit well. If we give them good information, they're going to be able to do better for us as well too. So as you've seen, uh, you know, there's all these different steps. You know, there's digital impressions. There's 3D face scanning and smile design. Uh, we have wax ups. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about this. This is like digital dentures. Uh, but we talked a little bit about my navigated surgery, which I cut out some of it so that we could just kind of give you a glimpse of what that looks like. Uh, 3D face scans. Uh, again, planning surgery with all this technology. And then in the future, in another talk that I, or in the past, another talk I gave uh, for Henry Shine here was uh, one about night guards and others. But all these things are very important for us to know that technology is like the phone. Started out a certain way, got us accomplished, you know, accomplished a, a certain task. But now we have much more power in our pockets. We have iPhones and Android phones and just basically phones that are more powerful than computers in that time. You, know, you can fold the phone if you want to, as I mentioned. So because of that, I encourage you to remember that digital technology for dentistry is constantly changing. But it has got to a stage where, as you can see, the technology is allowing us to do the things that I've been able to do and you can as well. So as I started out with this quote, you know, we know that times are changing. So I want to finish off with a quote. One of my favorite all time people in the world is, uh, you know, here in, in, in Canada, we love hockey. And so, uh, you know, I wish we had the Stanley Cup back here, but we haven't had it for like my whole lifetime. No, just kidding. But uh, basically uh, the best in the game, Mr. Wayne Gretzky, he's the best hockey player to ever walk this earth. He basically says, go where the puck is going. Go where the puck is going. He knows, and to be the best in the world, he saw the puck going down ice. He chased it. He was faster than everybody else. He got there, and he basically took over. He didn't stand there, stand still. He didn't turn around and go the other way. He basically understands that the puck is going down ice. So for us in in dentistry, the puck is going down ice. It's 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 moving. It's not. It's going to be there in five years. It's not. You know, maybe it's going to be there later. It's there. And so I encourage you to make sure you um, uh, look at all the technology, embrace it, understand that it's okay to to use technology. Not that it's not okay to use old technology. It's just the technology is here and it's here to stay. 
and it's here to help us in all that we do. So I thank you so much for the time that you've uh, spent with us. Uh, we've gone right to the hour, so I don't want to uh, spend too much more time. But if you do have questions, please, please keep in touch. You can message me at uh, Instagram is the fastest or email. You can find that at theprostodonis.ca. But uh, I hope to keep in touch. Uh, and hopefully one day we can see you in person again. Take care. Have a great day. See ya. Thank you so much, Dr. Ng, for the amazing presentation. As a thank you for attending, everyone will receive the recording via email sometime in the next week. If you'd like to view our upcoming webinars, visit henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our schedule. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.